It's really um, a privilege to inter introduce Dan. I think he's known to many of you, some of you anyway. Uh, certainly, I, I count him as a friend and admire him uh, from his professional work as a government servant, but even more, he's uh, one of those rare people who's managed to move from journalism into public policy and back and forth and retain his integrity and independence and clarity of voice and uh, do good work in lots of different guises. Uh, and it's, it's really terrific to have him here as the keynoter for this conference because I think not only is he in the right job to offer this kind of perspective as the counterterrorism uh, coordinator at the Department of State with the rank of ambassador soon to become I believe an assistant secretary of state once the uh, long uh, argued over counterterrorism office is finally elevated to a State Department bureau, which is to happen soon. Uh, so not only does he have the, the right perspective uh, in terms of access to current information and conversation both within the United States government and perhaps as importantly through con constant global travel, but for a conference that's framed around the 10 years that have passed since 9-11, he's also uh, one of those rare specialists who has been studying al-Qaeda, its affiliates, and the context in which they have arisen and operated uh, since well before it was fashionable uh, or even well understood. Uh, Dan um, uh, went to Harvard and uh, Oxford as a Marshall Scholar. Uh, despite that, he's an awfully decent guy. Um, <laughs> and uh, after uh, college, he worked as a journalist for Time Magazine. He was a foreign correspondent in uh, Germany, among uh, other assignments. And then uh, he entered uh, the National Security Council staff in 1994 and served there until 1999, eventually uh, as a uh, senior figure on the, in the Counterterrorism Bureau working with uh, Steve Simon and uh, Dick Clark uh, at the moment when a relatively small people inside of government uh, recognized that the United States had a problem on its hands uh, that uh, much of the public and uh, indeed much of the government simply did not understand uh, in its full dimensions. Uh, he and Steve Simon demonstrated their sort of sense of where uh, this was going by writing a book uh, called The Age of Sacred Terror that was published uh, in 2002 but actually reflected the understanding and, and research they had done uh, prior to the 9-11 attacks. And with, uh, I think, Peter Bergen's work provided one of the most reliable, early, and essential sources of clarity and balanced analysis uh, for American and English readers after the 9-11 attacks. Uh, he and Steve uh, also wrote a book a few years later called The Next Attack that was an equally sharp assessment of uh, really about five years after 9-11 where both the enemy and American counterterrorism responses had, had arrived. Uh, as I say, these are all reasons to admire uh, Dan and even resent him, but it's very difficult to do so uh, because he really is a terrific guy uh, as evidenced by his willingness to share his time with us today. He's going to talk for 30 minutes or so, 25 or 30 minutes, and then we'll take some questions from the floor. Dan. I must say, I wish I got such warm greetings at all the meetings I went to. Uh, and I particularly want to thank Steve for that. I, I, the temptation after an introduction like that is to sit down because nothing you can possibly do will live up to it. Um, but it is really a great pleasure to be here at New America again. Uh, I was here before I was in government any number of times, and I've always enjoyed coming. And uh, it's great to see Steve and Peter Bergen and so many other friends and colleagues uh, in the audience here. Um, as someone who spent um, uh, the last decade and a half uh, either inside the think tank world or uh, in government consuming uh, the products of the think tank world, I have to say I have the greatest admiration for uh, New America, which I have to say in, in, in next to no time at all uh, put itself on the map and became a, a, a central focal point, if that isn't redundant, of, uh, of the debate on so many issues. Uh, and has done it so impressively. And I have to say that as a former journalist, uh, I particularly admire the uh, uh, emphasis you've put on being part of the debate, on being in print, on uh, keeping your, uh, your fellows uh, in ink all the time. 
I think it's absolutely fabulous, good for the democracy, good for the discussion. Uh, you've put together a great lineup today, um, and um, I'm quite honored to be part of it. Well, as you noted, Steve, I've, I've been looking at al-Qaeda for some time, and um, throughout that period have been asking the question, uh, what is the relationship between al-Qaeda and uh, the affiliated groups it has cultivated in, in disparate places? These have been dynamic, changing ties, and I believe, Steve, that uh, uh, both you and I mentioned uh, in books we wrote what seems like a long time ago that uh, the first metaphor, I think, that uh, uh, was used about al-Qaeda was that it was the Ford Foundation of uh, global terror. Well, that many other metaphors have been used as well, but after the East Africa embassy bombings and, of course, 9-11, uh, the metaphors changed dramatically and no one was using such benign analogies. The ties to affiliates have evolved uh, with varying degrees of command, control, influence between the core and the affiliates. This conference is particularly timely because, as most of us recognize, the affiliates are playing a greater role uh, today, a more menacing role today, uh, than they have in quite some time. That development is not uh, an overnight one by any means. It's been in train for some time. But we are in a decidedly different place today from where we were, say, two or three years ago. And what makes the issue of the affiliates uh, particularly urgent now is that the context in which they operate has changed so dramatically in, in uh, the matter of just a few months. So let me begin by outlining the global threat environment, and then I will uh, um, suggest uh, what it is we're trying to do uh, to deal with this changing situation. Let's start at the heart of the matter, uh, the AQ core leadership in Pakistan, the group responsible for 9-11. As you know, uh, the U.S. and Pakistan together uh, in counterterrorism cooperation have put considerable pressure on AQ and Pakistani military operations aimed at eliminating strongholds in the federally administered tribal areas have degraded much of the group's abilities. As a result, the AQ core has had significant leadership losses and is finding, more, uh, finding it more difficult to raise money, train recruits, and plan attacks outside of the region. But although AQ Corps is clearly weaker, it retains the capability to conduct regional and transnational attacks. In addition, AQ has forged closer ties with some of the other militant groups in the region, for example, Tariqi Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban, and the Haqqani Network. And this has provided the group with additional capabilities that it can draw on. In the last year, of course, we've seen two high-profile law enforcement cases involving individuals who appear to have been trained and handled from the FATA, operating with the U.S. borders. And this is, of course, in distinction to what we had seen uh, in the post-9-11 period. Najib Bolazazi, a U.S. lawful permanent resident, uh, got his training uh, in Pakistan and, and uh, pleaded guilty to charges that he was planning to set off several bombs in the U.S. We also saw Faisal Shahzad, uh, who was linked to the Pakistani Taliban attempt to detonate a car bomb in Times Square just uh, almost a year ago. And the significance of these cases uh, and the ties that they illustrate <coughs> cannot be ignored. Although I would not characterize it as an affiliate, though its ideologies bear uh, many similarities, the continued menace of Lashkari Taiba, a large, well-armed, technically capable terrorist group, adds as well to the overall threat in South Asia. Now, while the AQ Corps has weakened operationally, the affiliates have become stronger. And consequently, the broader AQ threat has become more geographically and ethnically diversified. At the top of the affiliates list is al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP, as everyone I'm here, I'm sure, knows. It continues to demonstrate its growing ambitions and its strong desire to carry out attacks outside of the region. AQAP established itself as the first of the AQ affiliates to make attacks against the U.S. at home as a central goal. As you know, the group made its debut in this regard with the uh, Christmas Day 2009 attempt to destroy an airliner bound for Detroit. Then in October 2010, it sought to blow up several U.S.-bound airplanes by posting bombs in, uh, in uh, cargo uh, that would have been in the plane's holds. As those efforts and AQAP's failed attempt on the life of Saudi Arabia's Deputy Interior Minister demonstrated the group is technologically innovative and eager to put new tactics into use quickly. AQ affiliates are also taking on a greater share of the propaganda work, and here too AQAP is at the forefront. Last July, we saw it release AQ's first English language online magazine, Inspire, and four subsequent issues have been uh, released since. 
Although the magazine failed to arouse sustained interest from Western media, it has provided a platform for Anwar al-Awlaki, who has emerged as an operational and ideological leader of AQAP. And I want to underscore, Alaki is no mere messenger, but someone integrally involved in lethal terrorist activities. Through his sermons, videos, and online writings, AQAP has opened up a new field of recruitment among English language speakers. Let's move now to Northwest Africa, where no group has made a bigger name for itself in the kidnapping for ransom business than Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM. And it's worth noting here that kidnapping for ransom has become one of, if not the foremost, source of revenue for AQ-related groups everywhere. And while that is itself deeply worrying, and we can talk about this later if you like, I think it's also a sign of uh, the excellent work that was done in counterterrorism finance, uh, begun by Juan Zarate, who's here, and, and uh, carried on by, uh, by others. AQIM has raised tens of millions in euros in the past several years through kidnapping for ransom operations. Um, it currently holds four Frenchmen who were abducted from the Arriva uranium compound uh, in uh, Niger uh, last September. In January, we saw an attempted kidnapping of two young Frenchmen in Niger fail when they were killed during a rescue operation involving Nigerian and uh, French commandos. We believe much of this ransom money goes to sustain the organization, which is no small feat in the uh, environment of the Sahel, but there is plenty as well to build tr truck bombs, and these have been used in places such as Mauritania and Niger, although not with great success from the terrorist perspective. AQIM has attacked and ambushed military forces in Mauritania and Algeria recently, as well as others in Niger and Mali, and the group is working to increase its operational reach in West Africa. If we move to the Horn of Africa, we see that Al-Shabaab is a somewhat different kind of organization, composed of a, a range of groups with varying uh, motivations and, and interests. Some of Al-Shabaab's senior leaders have links to Al-Qaeda and are interested in waging a global struggle in the classical mode, while others have a purely Somali agenda, and some others, of course, are just in it for the money. Yet this group has also expanded its reach. Last July, we saw al-Shabaab conduct its first major attack outside of Somalia, when claimed responsibility for tw twin suicide bombings uh, at the time of the Soccer World Cup uh, that killed 76 people in Kampala. Al-Shabaab's widening scope of operations and safe haven in Somalia makes it a continuing threat to East Africa and to U.S. interests in the region. In addition, and this has also been much discussed in the press, Al-Shabaab has a cadre of Westerners, including fighters of ethnic Somali descent drawn from the global Somali diaspora, as well as American converts, and this makes it a matter of particular concern. We shouldn't omit mention of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which has continued to suffer leadership losses and has seen its constituency further dwindle. Although AQI remains capable of carrying out occasional signature attacks. It is believed to be responsible for the February attack on Iraq's largest oil refinery and the late March attack on the Saladin Provincial Council headquarters. Still, its violent tactics have failed to destabilize the Iraqi government or ignite the sectarian violence that it sought. Instead, we saw a successful 2010 election in Iraq and a decision by Sunni leaders in the country to participate in the political process. We could talk about other groups. There seems to be no, uh, no shortage of them, but why don't we step back here and just um, uh, note that while this shift has been underway for some time, the events of the last few months in Tunisia, Egypt, and elsewhere have really altered the context dramatically. We are indeed in a fast-changing landscape and a season of transformative change in the Middle East whose full implications are still taking shape. And, Journalists here will remember that if you covered uh, what happened in, uh, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe in 1989-1990, uh, those events were five, six, seven years in train, at least if you don't go back to solidarity in 1981. This happened in a blink of an eye. It's really an extraordinary commentary on how things have, have changed. <clears throat> but the changes of government and the broad-based efforts to win new freedoms for the people of the region hold, and I think we should be very clear about this, enormous promise. Tremendous numbers of citizens advance peaceful public demands for change in a precedence-shattering way, and in, in uh, some places, Libya and Syria, for example, we have seen others risk and sometimes lose, lose their lives through opposition. They have done so 
without reference to al-Qaeda's incendiary worldview, thus upending the group's longstanding claim that change would only come through violence. These men and women in the streets have underscored anew and in the most powerful fashion the lack of influence al-Qaeda exerts over the central political issues in key Muslim-majority countries. Should the res these revolts, should these uprisings result, as we hope, in durable, democratically elected, non-autocratic governments, then AQ's single-minded focus on terrorism as an instrument of political change would be severely, and I think irretrievably, delegitimized. And this would indeed be a strategic blow. The successful democratic outcome of the demonstrations we have seen and the striving of so many to enjoy their basic human freedoms is something all of us should support because this is a profound good in its own right. But I want to add that from the security perspective, we also have a great deal to gain because democracies increase the space for peaceful dissent and give people a stake in their governance that greatly weakens those who call for violence. We should be clear, this is a moment of extraordinary possibility for Americans, for the global community, and most of all, for the inhabitants of these Muslim-majority nations. Inspiring as the moment may be, we cannot, however, ignore the attendant perils. The political turmoil has distracted security officials in a number of countries. We are concerned with both the issue of terrorist transit in light of the instability in Libya and with the threat posed by loose munitions previously under Libyan government control. We are working aggressively to counter these potential dangers, though this will continue to be complicated by the lack of resolution to the current unrest. Undoubtedly, terrorist groups will be tempted to exploit the situation to carry out conspiracies. We know the turmoil has caught the eye of Al-Qaeda, which is trying to insinuate itself into this picture. Terrorist plots, it should be obvious to all of us, have significant disruptive implications for states undergoing challenging and difficult democratic transitions. Well, let me now begin to address the question of what we're doing to, uh, to deal with this threat. To begin with, of course, we're working with our various interagency partners, such as Homeland Security, the military, and the intelligence community to keep Americans and our interests safe. The subject of the innovations in particular in Homeland Security would easily fill uh, a whole other lecture. And uh, I can give you the names of plenty of colleagues who'd be delighted to give it. Uh, but with this whole of government approach, we are comprehensively strengthening our partnerships around the world by ensuring that all US government security assistance providers are working from the same playbook, that they're making sure that our assistance is more, assistance is more balanced to improve both security and long-term governance and the rule of law. Helping our partners more effectively confront the threat within their borders is both good counterterrorism and good statecraft. So let's look at some of the key regional issues and begin with Pakistan and Afghanistan. As everyone recognizes, the Fatah and Khyber Pakhtunwa continue to be used as a base for terrorist organizations operating in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And Pakistani security forces have undertaken efforts to counter these threats. Pakistan has made some progress on the CT front against other groups specifically against Tariq -e Taliban Pakistan. But the challenges remain to make, the challenge remains to make these gains durable and sustainable. In Pakistan, we're focusing on shared threats as well as addressing Pakistan's political and economic challenges. Since 2009, we've worked with the Pakistani government and the Pakistani people, including through our enhanced strategic dialogue, which met twice last year at the ministerial level. And I co-chair the Law Enforcement and Counterterrorism Working Group which includes representatives from the FBI, DOJ, Treasury, and DHS, and which has been focused on three main issues, establishing a cooperative law enforcement framework, illicit finance, and border security. We're working closely with the government of Pakistan on a range of counterterrorism-related capacity building projects, including numerous training courses for Pakistani police, which are administered by the State Department's Diplomatic Security Bureau. Our International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs Bureau also works closely with uh, the Pakistani government on border security and other law enforcement matters. It routinely provides Pakistani security and police forces with equipment to counter extremism, and it is truly a whole of government effort. FBI and DOJ are working with their counterparts on investigations, prosecutorial, and training matters. 
Treasury and DHS are working with Pakistan on important matters related to terrorism finance <coughs> and border security. Even as we've endured serious challenges to the relationship, some of which have made headlines, we've continued civilian and military assistance throughout the country and solidified our cooperation. Pakistan today is more willing to take on extremist groups that directly threaten Pakistani targets, such as military bases, intelligence offices, and police stations. The TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, is a prime example of such groups. Nevertheless, we continue to press Pakistan for increased action against that group and to engage other allies on the dangers posed by Lashkar-e Taiba and to encourage all parties to take appropriate action against that group. Yemen. Well, obviously, we're talking here about a country smack in the middle of a transition and in the headlines every day. But to put things in perspective, let me back up a bit. The gravity of the AQAP threat was clear to the Obama administration from day one, and we've been focused on Yemen since the outset. In the spring of 2009, the administration initiated a full-scale review of Yemen policy, and that led to a new whole-of-government approach to Yemen that led to re-engagement with the government of Sana'a on counterterrorism after seven, several years of a cool relationship. Our approach also aims to coordinate our efforts with those of other international actors. Our strategy seeks to deal with imminent and developing threats. At the same time, it addresses the root causes of instability in, in uh, Yemen and to improve governance there. Central to this approach is building the capacity of Yemen's government to exercise its authority and deliver security and services to its people. Given the interlinked nature of Yemen's challenges and the implications for U.S. interests, we've adopted a comprehensive and sustained approach taking into account political, cultural, socioeconomic, and security factors. To help meet immediate security concerns, we've provided training and equipment to particular units of the Yemeni security forces with counter-terrorist and border control responsibilities. In coordination with our security efforts, the USG has also increased development to Yemen significantly. And development programs from Yemen in the fiscal year 2008 went from roughly $11 million to 2010 of over $100 million. We are in a period of uncertainty, but uh, let me just stress that our shared interest with the Yemeni government in fighting terrorism, particularly in defeating AQAP, does not rely solely on one individual. And we are hopeful that any successor government in Yemen will be a solid counterterrorism partner. <clears throat> Let me go back now to North Africa. I mentioned a moment ago, I mentioned the importance of international partnerships in fighting terrorism. And where possible, these should be not only bilateral, but regional, because the threat knows no borders. The US created such a regional partnership in Northwest Africa, the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, in 2005. The strategic goals of TSCTP are to build military and law enforcement capacity, foster regional cooperation, and counter violent extremism. We very much want the region to lead on CT, rather than to be led by a group of Western allies. TSCTP is working to enhance a range of military and civilian capabilities in the Sahel, including Mauritania, in Mauritania, Mali, Chad, and Niger, and farther south with Nigeria, Senegal, and Burkina Faso. And it's also facilitating cooperation between those countries and our TSCTP partners in the Maghreb, namely Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. We believe that this program is beginning to pay off with partners taking a greater than ever role in CT operations in the region. We've also seen positive signs of greater regional cooperation among these countries, particularly between Algeria, Mauritania, and Mali. Select allies in other parts of the world, such as Canada and France, have also joined to bolster TSCTP efforts with their own programs that complement ours. And while we work in the regional forum, I'd also point out to our intensified bilateral engagement. In Algeria, for example, the quality of our CT relationship has improved dramatically in the last two years. In the most critical aspects involving military and law enforcement and information sharing, we have greatly improved linkages with, Al with the Algerian government. And one recent example of this was the inauguration of our bilateral counterterrorism contact group, which had its first meeting past, uh, just in this past March, where, it, uh, which I, where I represented the United States. <clears throat> I mentioned all that's going on in the Maghreb. And clearly, successful transitions in Tunisia and Libya will be the best bar to inroads by violent extremists in both countries and in North Africa more broadly. 
In the short term, however, the instability in Libya and the transition in Tunisia may provide AQIM with new openings, and we cannot afford to become complacent. We must continue to adjust our strategy in response to the evolving conditions, work with our partners in the region to preserve the gains we've made, and bilaterally, uh, both through TCTP and bilaterally, as well as to ensure that we remain on track to achieve our goals of containing and marginalizing AQIM. Uh, finally, in the Horn of Africa, obviously this is one of the most difficult places uh, that we face. The chronic instability and the lack of a strong government in Somalia creates fertile ground for al-Shabaab, which poses a serious threat to the U.S. and to regional interests. The recent offensive by the transitional federation government, federal government, excuse me, uh, and the African Union mission in Somalia, AMISOM, has shown some promise in fighting al-Shabaab, but a great deal more work remains to be done. The U.S. continues to pursue a dual-track approach to create stability in Somalia. On the one track, we support the Djibouti process, while, encouraging, while continuing to encourage the TFG to reach out to moderates that support peace and stability in Somalia. On track two, and I think here this is um, something where we, ha where we have made important innovations, we are broadening our outreach to include greater engagement with Somaliland, Puntland, and regional and local anti-Al-Shabaab anti -Al -Shabaab actors and groups throughout south-central Somalia in order to broaden the security and stabilization efforts throughout the country. We're reaching out to diaspora communities and civil society um, <clears throat> to foster dialogue and peaceful reconciliation. And let me just say, I'm not going to go into great detail now, we're creating in East Africa something much like what we have in North Africa, uh, a integrated, an integrated program called the Partnership for Regional East African Counterterrorism. And we think that this, too, will have broad benefits for our work in the region. Well, there's a lot more that we can talk about, but let me just, um, in, the, in the desire to get to the Q&A, uh, just uh, try to put this all in a framework. The Arab Spring only underscores the need for us to further improve our capacity building programs with an ever greater, with an ever greater focus on civilian uh, law enforcement uh, and broader rule of law efforts. I do believe we're on the right track. The kinds of efforts I've described in Yemen, the Trans-Sahara, and elsewhere are cornerstones of our counterterrorism policy, which we continue to try to take to a truly strategic level. Strengthening political will while building uh, capacity that will ultimately result in par partner nation ownership of more security capabilities is the way to deal with the threats we face. We are working to make the counterterrorism training of police, prosecutors, border officials, and members of the judiciary more systematic, more innovative, and more far-reaching. And we are ad addressing the state weaknesses that terrorism thrives on, helping our partners to become more effective in countering the threats they and we face. Before closing, I want to mention one other area of activity where we are innovating, namely in our programs to counter radicalization and violent extremism. Compared to the capacity building work, which has been going on for many years, this is relatively new activity, but I believe it will be crucial. This focuses on three main lines of effort that will reduce terrorist recruitment, delegitimizing the violent extremist narrative in order to diminish what we call the pull factor, developing positive alternatives for youth who are vulnerable to radicalization to diminish the push effect of grievances and unmet expectations, and finally building partner capacity to carry out these activities. To counter AQ propaganda, we have helped stand up within the State Department an interagency body called the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism uh, Communication, the CSCC, <clears throat> which is to push back against AQ's online and media activities. And one emphasis of the CSCC has been to reorient our digital outreach team to place greater emphasis on challenging extremist messages online in Arabic and Urdu. And this has included producing some original video content that some of you may, f may be familiar with. Success at CVE, however, is going to involve more than messaging. And we are working with the interagency to develop programs that address the upstream factors of radicalization in communities that are particularly susceptible to terrorist recruitment overseas. Efforts include providing alternatives for at-risk youth, encouraging the use of social media to generate local initiatives, and enhancing the resilience of communities to counter extremism. Another central part of, um, of my office's CVE effort is strengthening our partners, 
propagating best practices and building an international consensus between the effort to delegitimize extremists and their ideologies. And ultimately, this is going to be the key to success because this is the road to sustainable uh, countering violent extremism efforts. Let me just conclude by saying the threat remains formidable, but we're making progress. Al Qaeda has proven itself an adaptable and nimble adversary, as you all know as well as I do. In the race to protect the United States and to stay one step ahead, we too must stay sharp, improve our offense, maintain our intellectual edge, and continually adapt to changing conditions on the ground. We must constantly evaluate each situation to ensure that we use our most effective tools of civilian statecraft to continue to serve our national security interests. This is a continuing challenge, and as we've seen recently, the specifics can change quickly and dramatically. But I think we are working along the right principles and along the right guidelines, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I welcome your questions. cogent presentation and one that was eerily on point for the subject of the conference, uh, a really it's a, terrific it's a, survey. It's a real failure as a government official if you address the <laughs> issue at hand. But, yes, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, well, we're, we're appreciative of it, appreciative. I, I'm just going to ask one question then turn it over to the audience. I wanted to actually to ask a, a regional question. You talked uh, several different times and in interesting ways about the challenges in, in the Maghreb and uh, thinking about AQIM in particular. Um, you're a student of uh, Muslim Brotherhood influenced political formations and parties in the Arab world. You'll recall from your own scholarship the episodes around Gamal Slamiya in Egypt, a violent splinter of Muslim Brotherhood influenced uh, groups. Obviously today in these important transition co countries, Tunisia and Egypt in particular, there are a peaceful, large political formations that are either explicitly rooted in the Muslim Brotherhood's history or influenced by it. Um, and then there are also young, unaffiliated Salafi youth running around in the streets setting things on fire. How do you analyze the role of the Muslim Brotherhood political parties as um, an element of this counterterrorism challenge in particular? Are you engaging them? What's your strategy? Are they part of the solution? Are they part of the problem? Are you not sure? Well, I hate those substantive questions. Um, uh, uh, it, it is, of course, a core uh, question. And, um, and yes, we all are aware of um, the sparks that the Brotherhood threw off at various points and of uh, the violence that it embraced early on. I think that you um, <coughs> embedded the uh, answer right in your question insofar as you noted uh, its current peaceful orientation, which it has been very explicit about and which, frankly, the track record of the last couple of decades, I think in, in Egypt they renounced violence in the 70s, for example, uh, is uh, very much to the point. And the key issue for the United States going forward is going to be, are the groups that we are going to engage with going to be peaceful? Uh, are they going to be dedicated to um, the rule of law, to democratic institutions? And if they meet those tests, I think we absolutely need to engage with them. And I think it's also important, and this is not something that's often discussed in the, um, in the Washington discussion, the extent to which uh, you know, without saying what kind of partner the, the Brotherhood would be down the line, but the extent to which the MB has been, you know, deeply opposed, I wouldn't say violently opposed, but that would really be the wrong word, deeply opposed to extremism, to violent extremism. And, um, you know, those of us who've studied this and have read the polemics between, for example, Ayman al-Zawahiri and the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, this has been a very important uh, you know, break against uh, extremism, and when you consider the extent, the strength of uh, of the Ikhwan in uh, Egypt, you know, it, it, it has the potential to play a, a positive role in terms of dealing with violent extremism. There are obviously a lot of other political issues that need to be dealt with, and uh, there are obviously a lot of uh, matters on which, um, you know, we will, we may not agree with them. But if they are peaceful, if they're, if they're uh, dedicated to uh, the rule of law and to democratic institutions and the peaceful developments of their countries, then they have to be part of the conversation. Highly thoughtful. Hope that becomes policy. Um, 
from the audience. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Returning immediately to your, your statement there, un unfortunately, it would appear, and you're far more schooled in these things than I am, that what you're saying is somewhat antithetical, that, that the, the fundamentalists, violent or not, fundamentalist Islamists are by their own espousals anti-democratic, that they consider democracy uh, as obtrusive as almost offensive to Allah. So how do we break that immediate barrier? Well, uh, I do want to distinguish between the different groups that Steve was talking about. Uh, those who are in the streets torching cars or who are attracted to Al Qaeda and who uh, oppose um, you know, the democratic development of their, of their states um, are obviously not going to be partners for us uh, in, in um, insofar as we have a role in uh, dealing with these countries in the future and these societies. Um, but those that are, in fact, uh, determined to um, see their countries develop, become part of the 21st century economy, become part of the global community in a full way, and become part of the community of democracies, um, you know, will be. And right now, I think that we need to look at what the different groups are saying, the Muslim Brotherhood in particular, given uh, its numbers, uh, and what the record shows. And, um, you know, there may be closer students of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in the audience or, or, or watching this um, uh, than I am, um, but at least in Egypt, uh, the, uh, the record of statements is quite clear in the support for uh, democratic institutions. And I don't just mean one election. And of course, you know, as with all conversational partners, as with all interlocutors, they need to be tested. And we need to see where this goes. But I do think that we uh, have a responsibility to be careful analysts and to um, both ensure that we're satisfied by what people are saying is what they truly believe, but also that we don't tar unnecessarily uh, enormous sectors of societies because of uh, our own perhaps um, insufficient understanding of the groups involved, their history, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have, a, as I said, we have a huge interest in the peaceful um, and uh, democratic evolution of these countries and to rule out uh, interlocutors uh, who are going to have a, a clear and a powerful role in these countries uh, without, you know, really examining who they are and what they're about, I think would be a big mistake. I flatten them, I guess. All right, well, I'll ask Juan while you're thinking. <laughs> Juan, did you have one? Yeah. that very much. Um, <clears throat> have, have you all thought about reconceptualizing what CVE means in this uh, Arab Spring environment? That is to say, a lot of the CVE thinking was born of a, in a pre-Arab Spring environment. And have, uh, have you thought about, either in concert with USAID or others, thinking about how a CVE construct uh, works where Al Qaeda and violent, extremis is, violent extremism isn't the principal adversary, but instead a promotion f of the, the very principles of the Arab Spring become the primary goal uh, of uh, a reinforcing CVE campaign. So how is the Arab Spring affecting your notion of what CVE actually means globally? Uh, it's, a, it's a characteristically good question, Juan. Thanks. Um, I, <coughs> I think that when we came in and uh, when the administration began in 2009, there was already um, a discussion underway as to um, how we would do countering violent extremism. And I think that some of the changes that we did in uh, conceptual changes in 2009, 2010 have put us in a good place uh, for going forward in which 
Um, we want to be very careful about what the um, goals of CVE are and how we distinguish between CVE goals and outreach because um, we have a, a, a powerful interest in the success of these societies. I, I've said that already. But we also have a powerful interest um, that uh, requires that we not uh, make everyone feel like they are the target of, a, of what is ultimately a counterterrorism uh, policy. And if we are going to engage in all kinds of you know, positive salutary outreach works, whether it's through AIDs, governance work, education, health care, on down the line, if we, are, uh, if we hitch that wagon too closely you know, to the counterterrorism horse, then I think that we are um, creating a bad dynamic and, and you know, the, the, the catchword is securitizing everything we do. Uh, we should be doing those things because they're the right thing to do. If they succeed, they will have clear benefits in terms of pushing back uh, extremism. But as we do, um, uh, but we, there's still a requirement to address um, areas where we see the thriving of, you know, an al-Qaeda worldview that is related to actual activity uh, that could potentially be violent and would lead to uh, terrorism. So if, I think if you start with that division of labor, that, that understanding, then I think you're set up to go ahead and do the kind of work that, you know, we as a, a nation with a sense of how we want to help others develop uh, can do the uh, assistance work that is necessary, but also, you know, promote our own security interests through CVE. Um, I do think that we have been handed, uh, you know, a, a great issue, a great tool to say, you know, this really is the way to, um, a, you know, thriving economies, uh, rewarding government governance, you know, that is responsive to the uh, uh, aspirations of, uh, of their people through what's happened over the last few months. I mean, it's quite inspiring, and I think that, uh, you know, that, that this is something that we should, uh, we should attach ourselves to and, and, you know, make all those appropriate connections. But uh, what we shouldn't do is turn this into, um, you know, an opportunity to do counterterrorism on the grand scale. Here. Ambassador Benjamin, thank you for uh, your comments. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a very predictable event that uh, in a way presents some opportunities and also some pitfalls for countering violent extremism, which is the 10th anniversary of 9-11, which if it was mishandled could be a sort of inadvertent uh, you know, mi mini tactical victory for Al-Qaeda to remind the world about this big a supposed victory that they achieved if the government doesn't approach it in the right way. And what are your thoughts about how you have to commemora commemorate it, but how, what are the themes and, and, and what is the tone that you take uh, when you're doing that? It's uh, deeply unfair, Peter, to be asking questions of government officials regarding events that are months away. <laughs> I think you need to spend a few years in the interagency. But, um, you know, I do think that you, you – uh, uh, you make a very good point, um, and uh, and they're, they're, your 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 view is is widely shared. And of course, we're very keen to uh, avoid turning this uh, into an opportunity for Al Qaeda to uh, reassert itself and say, "See what we did? Okay, forget about the fact that it was our ten years ago." But um, so we we don't want to do that. I think that there will be a heavy emphasis on. Um, you know, the, the strides that we have made both uh, by ourselves at home but also internationally working with partners. And uh, I, I hope Juan would agree with me that one of the great um, uh, positive stories of the last 10 years has really been the uh, development of uh, a common cause against terrorism that was unthinkable before 2001 and ha that has seen um, the creation of uh, you know, connections between governments that are so much stronger and below the surface uh, than I think we ever could have imagined on September 12th. So I, th I think that it is actually a moment in which, um, without spending a lot of time talking about events in a way that would open the door to Al Qaeda, we do have um, quite a positive story to tell about where we have gone since then. 
and uh, about how we view the future, and particularly against the backdrop of something like the Arab Spring. I think that uh, um, you know we have a lot of a lot to work with. Um, but uh, your you know you, the cautionary note implicit in your question is is well taken. Stephen, I saw, and then Christina, and then I'll come over here. Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, you'd spoken about regional uh, counterterrorism strategy and about cooperation at a CT level with Pakistan, and I was wondering if you could speak uh, a bit more broadly about regional counterterrorism strategy for the South Asian region and the degree to which cooperation with countries like India, Bangladesh, and Nepal is possible, because obviously some of the threats that have been based in Pakistan LT in particular, but also Harakat al-Jihad islami they have spread beyond just Pakistan and even India to, to other countries. Uh, thanks for the question, Steve. Um, I, and it actually uh, gives me an opportunity to talk about a success story that I think uh, uh, is probably not widely known, but is, is quite important. I think that we have, first of all, seen a significant improvement, I would say a major improvement, in terms of our counterterrorism coordination with uh, India. Uh, this is a very close relationship. Obviously, it's, uh, it's a challenge. It's an enormous country with a highly federal system, and that requires that we um, work hard with both uh, states as well as with uh, the federal government. But it has become a pillar of, uh, of our strategic uh, relationship, and uh, it is something that I work on quite closely. There's constant travel back and forth. We have uh, bilats on a range of different CT issues all the time. Uh, there are a number of different uh, activities involving lessons learned on things like Mumbai, on what we do in, uh, in some of our big metropolitan police forces. Uh, there is, I, I mean, interest in um, protecting mass transit. We're sharing lessons on things like that. Uh, it's really become quite a, a positive relationship. Additionally, uh, Bangladesh is, a, is quite a positive story. Um, and uh, it's not just a bilateral story, although that is a very good one, but actually relations between Bangladesh and India have improved quite impressively uh, in the last few years uh, to where they're really uh, working quite effectively on, um, uh, on preventing uh, infiltration uh, from Bangladesh to India. And, and Bangladesh itself has done quite a good job uh, in terms of its counterterrorism efforts. So there's a lot going on. There are still um, problems to be addressed. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but I would say, for example, Nepal has been a, an area in which we've seen uh, LET activity. And Nepal, of course, has had its own traumas with its insurgency and now appears to be coming to a, a better place and will be better suited to deal with its counterterrorism issues. Um, but I think that, uh, by and large, there, there are a number of key uh, good stories in, uh, in South Asia. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about an event that happened this week, um, which is the Kandahar prison breakout, and how concerned you are about any of the individuals that escaped. Well, um, the, the numbers involved speak for themselves as a, as a uh, source of concern. and. It, obviously is one that we're quite seized with at the moment. I think the, uh, uh, I, I can't speak about particular individuals um, right now, but I will say that uh, all of them were, uh, as it were, biometrically uh, enrolled, so they're, these people have a trail. And, uh, you know, the, we will be working with the Afghans to try to uh, bring them all back to, uh, to prison, but it obviously was not, uh, you know, a great moment for, uh, um, uh, for the prison system there, and uh, it's going to require a lot of work to uh, um, neutralize the effects of that. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm Mary Pat Renstrom. I'm a counterterrorism fellow at National Defense University, <coughs> and I'm actually going to touch on a topic that we haven't discussed much today at all. I'm finishing up a thesis talking about the Internet and its empowering influence, the force multiplication effect for al-Qaeda as they've hit the world. But I would ask you if you would to take a look at uh, what's happened in the uh, Arab Spring to talk about what influence the internet, which is really just a means, a tool for communicating, and what impact that may have had on what we saw happen there. Uh, well, 
I think that the historians will be looking at this for a long time. And uh, although I used to be in the uh, first draft of history business, I'm, I'm no longer called upon to do that. Uh, but obviously, the rapidity with which these uprisings happened and the and the um, the, dr the drama of the change suggests that we have to look hard at at, uh, at the electronic media uh, and the social media in particular as uh, causative factors in, in terms of bringing people into the street and, and demonstrating the like. Uh, smarter people than I will parse and figure out how, how important it was. But, uh, uh, you know, this was a chain of events that was just extraordinary from, you know, uh, that self tragic self-immolation in Tunisia to, uh, you know, where we are today in, in, in the blink of an eye. Um, but highly illustrative and obviously was something that has caused uh, governments around the world uh, to uh, think hard about uh, what they do uh, with the internet and how they have to conduct themselves in, in the uh, internet era. I think lots of my colleagues in government had already uh, recognized uh, just uh, what happens when you have something go viral on you, especially if it's false. This is obviously a, a level of concern that is far beyond that. Um, and um, I think it's a whole new area of uh, scholarly endeavor. Can I ask a, a question, uh, Ambassador, about your, the core subject of your remarks, which were the affiliates, and you introduced the historical observation that in the late 90s it was people like you understood the federated structure of Al-Qaeda and compared it to the Ford Foundation. When, um, and you went through each region, I think, very carefully and, and in a, a very informative way. But what can you say about the whole, the architecture of the relations between affiliates and the center today, after so much pressure has been placed upon the center? Um, what are the tightest relations, and what do those consist of, and what are the loosest relations, and how would you characterize those? Well, recognizing that any answer I give will result in 20 calls from different parts of the government when I get back, <laughs> let me, uh, let me, uh, be careful here. Um, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, I think um, AQAP is the group that has um, uh, maybe perhaps the closest communications relationship mindset uh, in uh, with the core. Um, I talked about the composite nature of Al Shabaab. There are people there who are. Um, really on the same wavelength as uh, AQAP. It is nonetheless striking that lots of different groups uh, in this particular period are um, capable of holding on to an Al-Qaeda worldview but charting their own, uh, charting their own strategy uh, and sometimes even you know, disregarding what they are hearing from the core. And you know, we talked about um, there's sort of two, there, there are these two uh, factors. One is the relationship between affiliate and, uh, and the core group, and there's also within, uh, within that, there's always the tension between the near enemy and the far enemy. And so you have all kinds of different torquing going on uh, all the time. And um, uh, for us, obviously, it's a great concern if, if a group like AQAP decides that it wants to make uh, the U.S., uh, you know, high on its on its target list, especially U.S. at home. Um, but the other thing to remember is, of course, if they're very successful uh, there on you know the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula, we've also got huge problems. Um, so uh, you do see the, this sort of dynamic ebb and flow. A lot of it is personality related. Uh, one of the questions that we uh, will be asking is. Uh, who might be in circulation now, who wasn't there six or eight months ago, who can change, you know, do, does, for example, the distraction of security services mean that there will be more travel by people who are closer to the core, to the affiliates, to rein them in, to give them direction? All of this is speculative. It's too early to say. We don't really know. But it is a different... Um, as I said before, it's a very different uh, context, and we have to watch that closely. Um, all of the groups that I discussed, however, you know, have had some 
uh, have some con connection, communication beyond just their aspirational, you know, we're an Al Qaeda in, in this part of the world uh, group, even AQAI, which, you know, historically was the most independent of them all. They all have their connections. Uh, they all have uh, a shared set of understandings. And uh, for that reason, they all pose a significant uh, danger to us. Uh, on behalf of the audience, on behalf of Peter Bergen and everybody here at New America, mm -hmm. thank you for being so generous with your pleasure. time. <laughs>